It's time now for our eight minutes of expertise segment. Tonight's topic focuses on police and use of force. Joining me is NIU Associate Professor of Sociology, Kirk Miller. Thanks, Kirk, so much for being with us here tonight. My pleasure. First off, tell us and viewers, what about your expertise in with police makes you an expert on these issues? Well, um, most of my research career has been focused on issues related to uh, police discretion, um, the institution of policing. Um, I've done a, a number of um, research studies and published um, on um, questions related to the agencies, law enforcement agencies across the country, um, with a special focus on agencies in the state of Illinois. Um, I've worked with um, various criminal justice agencies um, as well uh, on some of those projects and um, have worked both to incorporate citizen experiences and insights uh, and attitudes and opinions about police um, as well as um, to draw information directly from police agencies and in uh, many cases police officers themselves. So nationally, we're hearing conversations about restructuring the whole entirety of police departments. How difficult is it for that to happen and, and what really needs to happen for people to make changes to the police department? I think um, the story of policing in the United States could be characterized as the story of change. Um, police departments have been undergoing change really from their outset uh, in the United States um, well over 100 years ago. Periodically, um, certainly since the civil rights era of the 1960s in the United States, um, police departments and law enforcement agencies more generally have been asked to examine um, their relationship with uh, the communities that they respond to, that they serve, um, that they're a part of. Uh, and to um, look uh, at themselves as organizations in terms of um, trying to um, be more community oriented, to be more responsive, um, to be um, less uh, heavy handed, um, to put it euphemistically. And um, so that's been something that happens uh, or has happened periodically since the 1960s uh, Kerner Commission report that was focused on exactly many of the same issues and made many of the same kinds of recommendations as um, we're hearing this summer in 2020. And we hear police departments all over our area, Rockford specifically saying they teach de-escalation. So if that's being taught, then how is excessive force even happening? Uh, that's a great question. And, um, yeah, you know, there's sort of uh, at the outset, I suppose, I think there's probably some difference between what's taught and then what's practiced. Um, that's almost always the case as someone um, who spends a lot of or has spent a lot of my time um, as a professor and teaching students in the classroom. Um, what what people take away from training or what people take away from their um, learning experiences and in, in training sessions is um, not always exactly what uh, or as deep uh, or as complete as what we would expect or hope for. Um, in addition, um, one of the maxims that uh, is the case or is sort of is a, a, a well-known um, understanding uh, within law enforcement and police culture is that um, police experience a lot of training um, their academy experience before they um, go on to the street and, um, and become part of law enforcement agencies is a lot of um, formal um, book-oriented training activity. Um, and often, you know, what happens in terms of police officers' experiences um, on the street, uh, on patrol, um, in the job, um, doesn't necessarily correspond with what the focus of uh, their training experience is. One thing that people also complain about is that if they do have an issue with an officer, they think this officer has used excessive force and they make a complaint, it's police handling the complaints and they think there's a bias there that they're never going to have their point proved. So is that something that can change? Who can review that issue if not the police? Sure, um, I think that that's, that's an important um, aspect of some of the um, proposals that have come forward over the past few weeks and uh, months um, since the George Floyd incident um, and other incidents of high profile um, police violence or killing of citizens. Um, 
it's really important. I mean, it's a principle of our justice system that people that are involved in the um, investigation and the adjudication of persons who are alleged or suspected of committing crimes or engaged in other kinds of um, problematic unlawful behavior um, should receive or be subject to impartial investigation. And so um, in, in most cases, and this, this is sort of the origin of internal affairs units that are supposed to be separate from the it's kind of standard operating organizational chain of command that exists within most law enforcement agencies. That separation, even though it may be within the same police department, is intended to provide that, that degree of independence and impartiality in a sense in terms of investigations. There's questions about whether that's independent enough, certainly, and in many police departments, especially smaller departments, uh, there just isn't the, um, the personnel or uh, the resources to support those kinds of units. Um, having, uh, and, and a lot of this, frankly, is also focused not just on police officers investigating police, but also on district attorney's offices um, and the relationship between the district attorney and the police. The, so that relationship is really critical. District attorneys require, I'm sorry, um, depend upon and really require a, a pretty positive relationship with their local law enforcement agencies that they rely upon um, to collect evidence, um, to make arrests, um, and to work with them through charges and ultimately through trials. Uh, and so that has raised questions, certainly, I know over the past couple of months, particularly with the Ahmad Arbery um, uh, situation in, in Brunswick, Georgia, about um, the relationship for district attorneys with police departments in investigations that involve some measure of um, police wrongful behavior um, and possibly crime. And so, um, you know, moving investigations to district attorneys in other uh, jurisdictions, um, finding um, third party um, entities that are qualified, obviously, um, and committed to doing the work and to doing doing it in a way that doesn't, you know, either compromise the legitimacy of the investigation, or um, sort of the legitimacy of the um, individual or the office that's responsible for um, completing the investigation and, and making recommendations, including possibly charging decisions um, and or um, trying cases. Certainly an issue that is very apparent in this nationally right now, not just locally here, but something we have to keep an eye on. Kirk Miller, NIU Associate Professor of Sociology, we greatly appreciate you being here with us for eight minutes of expertise. Thanks, Kristen.